Hello and welcome. I'm Nurse Linda and um, for the uh, Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation. And welcome everyone. It's nice to see you today. Um, if you haven't met me before, I'd like to say hello and welcome. And if you have met me before or seen me on the webinars, welcome back. So here we are again today um, to talk about uh, what's going on in the world of, of paralysis to answer your questions talk a little bit about things that are going on. And uh, first of all, I wanna say thank you very much for joining us today. It's kind of a, a weird uh, period in time, isn't it? Is it not? Um, we are transitioning in, in, out of the pandemic stage of COVID, which is kind of nice. Uh, it's been officially announced that we're entering more the endemic stage. So um, as a person, much like many of you who have, um, it, who are immunocompromised, I am as well. And so I've kind of been taking little tentative steps out into the world, um, expanding myself. I've, I've been to the grocery store for several months now, all masked up and all that, and uh, going to get my own gas. So that's, that's nice. Um, but I, I've started to take these little baby steps out into the world. And it's kind of interesting because I would not have thought of this about myself, but I find now that we're able to go back out in the world, I find it a little difficult. Um, I was not happy about staying in my house. I'm a people person. I like to get out. I like to move about in the community. I like to go out and do things. And so at first it was kind of hard to stay in the house, but I was talking to a wise uh, sage and she was saying that she, she liked being in her house. And I thought, well, you know, I like being in my house too. So it was really helpful for me to adapt to being in my house a lot. I got very comfortable, got my routine down, you know, kind of got used to this lifestyle. And now it's like, all of a sudden you can go out, I can see people again. You know, you keep up on the on the video chats like we're doing now, and you keep up with people on the phone, you know, you do the best that you can, and, but there's something different about being person to person with somebody and being able to have more spontaneous kinds of conversations and reactions. So anyway, I've, I've been taking little baby steps going out in very safe places. Um, I went out for a lunch and I went out the other day and came down with this horrible cold, tested and tested for uh, COVID, but no COVID. So that was, a, that was a relief, but I had this horrible cold and it's been taking me a long time to get over it. I was thinking, you know, there's still COVID out in the world. I had just previously to uh, coming online today, I got a call from a family member who just contracted COVID. Uh, so immunocompromised. So um, we'll see how all that turns out. Well, yes, Pactin says a negative test means very little. It depends on what kind of test you're taking. Some tests um, are more reliable than other tests. So um, you have to look at which kind of test you're taking to make sure. Some, some of the tests are only 50% of the time right. So it's yes or no, 50% of the time, it's like a toss of a coin. Some of it, um, uh, otherwise, you know, is otherwise uh, better testing. So you want to look at that. Um, Paxton also writes in uh, also your viral load when testing and also um, notice in your own community what the viral load is in your community. So you can go on the CDC website. They've got a map. Most of the United States is green, but there are still some hot spots and hotspots pop up every now and again. So you can know what the viral load is in your county. So that can make you feel more comfortable in going out. If you know that, that the load of COVID is low out there in the world where you are, that's good for people who have children or you're going to the office. You need to know what the viral load is like in the community where you are. So at your school, at your work, those kind of places. And if somebody has COVID, you might want to think about uh, what's going on. Yes, yes, Paxton, there's the viral load within your specific body, but then also in reentry, you wanna think about the viral load that's out there in the community. So you can look at your county, maybe it's really good, but maybe there's an outbreak in your child's school, which might make you want to change your child um, back to um, video learning, which I know it's not real popular, 
but you know, all these things, you know, do you want to send your child to school knowing that there's an outbreak there? Do you want to go to work if somebody has had an, an outbreak at your work? So that re-entry into that community has been a very, very interesting kind of thing. Also, I think um, my susceptibility to infection is down a little bit because when we go out in the world, we're bombarded with all kinds of viruses and bacteria all the time that our body builds up resistance. Sometimes we get a little cold and we get over it, then our body has resistance to that particular bacteria. Uh, we might get a flu, then our body develops resistance to that particular strain of flu. But because they haven't been out for so long, our immune systems are kind of, you know, laying sluggish, I guess, a little bit, especially if you have neurological disease, your immune system can be sluggish. So you do want to take precautions. Um, still, when you go out, you want to be as safe as you can. And don't, don't go out until you feel like you're ready. Or do like me, do incremental plans that's kind of building up my self-confidence for going out. Um, but, you know, don't feel forced into anything. If, if you go out and you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Um, nobody should say anything to you about wearing a mask if you decide you want to. Um, I guess there are people that feel compelled to give their opinions about lots of things, but, you know, just do your own thing, be comfortable in being you and do your own thing. Keep washing your hands. You know, there is a new thing going out. I, I heard about it on the uh, news last night. It's not an epidemic, or a, but there's been a noticeable increase, especially in some of the European countries of uh, a certain uh, kind of hepatitis, certain kind of uh, liver problem that seems to be related to a strain of bacteria. So hand washing is a, a very good uh, practice that we're all in that should help us. That's the number one way to avoid this liver problem is to keep your hands extra clean. So you see it all, it all comes into, into play. Now, if other people are electing not to wear masks, Remember that your mask is a protection for you. We know that that's a protection, keeping your social distance, washing your hands. We know that all these strategies work and it's been proven in this grand experiment called the COVID pandemic. So we know, will there still be some breakthroughs? Yes, there will be, but the incidences are so low just doing these protective measures. So that's great. Um, so go out as you feel comfortable, I guess is what I would really like to stress. The other thing is I wanted to announce, um, I, don't, I don't really do announcements. I try not to do uh, pr product endorsements, any of that kind of thing. But there is this fellow, Rob uh, Oliver, who happens to have a spinal cord injury and he, he will tell you that. So he's an advocate for spinal cord injury. He does podcasts and he interviews different people in healthcare, but he's gonna be doing um, a, a gigantic pod podcast, 37 plus hours of podcasting, not of healthcare professionals, but of people who have healthcare concerns. And so particularly in that area of spinal cord injury and paralysis, he'll be doing this over May uh, 6th and 7th. So if you want to be on his podcast, he's going for the world record of podcasts um, through the Guinness record book. But it, it's very going to be very interesting because it's people who are living in the community and what they're thoughts are, what their positives are, what their concerns are, and what life is like for them. You get 15 minutes to talk to him. He has 150 slots, so you got a pretty good chance of getting in on this. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, email rob at perspectivesonhealthcare.com. That's his website, and I think you just register on his website. So it's rob at perspectivesonhealth.com care.com. So anyway, I plan to tune in on that because I think that will be interesting. It has been um, my pleasure to move into this world of people in the community. Now, working in healthcare, we think we know what's going on in the community, but until you're really engaged in it, I also have had a family member who's been in the world of paralysis. So you know, you think you really have it, but when you start talking to people, everybody's experience is so unique to them. And it's always an educational experience, something to think about, new ways to deal with things. You might tune in or to, to this webinar or other things and think, hey, that's just a piece of information that I needed. 
So if you have any questions, we have a lot of questions to get to today, but if you have any questions, be sure and write them in because if, you if you're questioning how to do something or wanna know information about something, I can guarantee you there's several thousand other people who are also interested in that information and sometimes getting to the right target is kind of a little bit difficult. So this month I've been talking about on the web um, joints, in particular the shoulder and the hip joints, because they are both uh, ball and socket joints. So one bone has a ball on the end of it and it fits in the socket. So if you think of your shoulder, your upper arm bone ends with um, a ball and it attaches up here to the shoulder bones in a socket. And the hip is the same way. The, the femur, the uh, higher leg bone has a ball at the end, attaches into the pelvis in a socket. But what can happen is that the muscles that surround that ball and socket joint can become lax through paralysis. So they don't have as much uh, stretch as they used to. They don't have as much protection of keeping that ball in that socket. And what can happen is it can slowly pass out of that. Now we see it a lot in um, shoulders, especially people who have had higher level spinal cord injury or who have had stroke because the weight of that arm is so heavy and it pulls on that bone, it pulls the ball joint out of the socket. You can even feel a little indentation when that happens. And, and we official medical assessment is to measure with your finger is that one finger width uh, uh, sublux that ball being pulled out of the so socket is called subluxation. So one fingertip, two fingertips, three fingertips, or four fingertips, you can see that's pretty far out of there. That's why we have troughs on wheelchairs, why people will wear maybe a sling or a harness sometimes. You can even get um, a, like a sleeve that fits up just over the top part of the arm and it, it has a strap that goes across the body that will hold the arm up in that socket because the weight of that, um, will cause that bone to separate. Another thing that causes problem with the shoulder bones is people pushing their, manually pushing their wheelchair in that they'll push, pull their arms way back. Now you can't see how far my arms are way back, but you can see that my shoulders have certainly changed positions. And so when that happens and you push, pull way far back because people like to get a good spin on those wheels so they get moving, you know, we're all in a hurry all the time, but you can get just as an effective push if you just hold your arms straight down from your body and just push that, that little bit forward, it doesn't put all this movement in your shoulders like that, which wears out the rotator cuff in your shoulder. And sometimes people have to have surgery on that, which it's, um, it's an uncomfortable surgery, but also it puts you out of commission for a long time because you can't use your shoulders until that heals up because you know you gotta let those muscles and everything heal up in there. And so that takes away a lot of people's independence for a great long time, several weeks of time. So it's real inconvenience for transfers, for moving around. Um, you can get adaptions, if you can get power assist, um, you can get uh, things to help you transfer. So there are ways that you can protect your shoulders, but the number one is if you're doing your manual wheelchair pushing to hold your arms straight down and just push the wheel forward. And you'll find that you can get a pretty good speed going doing that as well. Now the hips are a little bit different because people are sitting all the time. But if you think about your hip joints and as you're sitting, you always have your hips flexed and then you get in bed, you lay on your side, you have your hips flexed. So you really need to stretch out that hip joint so you don't get a contracture there. And uh, people will do that when they lay on their back or when they do range of motion to do it on their side to pull that hip joint because your hip joint does go back a little bit back from the body as well as forward. So doing that uh, counter action is really important to stretch out that hip joint. But as you're sitting, if you're not sitting on um, uh, pressure dispersing equipment that helps hold that hip joint in place. Sometimes those balls on the top of that femur bone can kind of just relax out of that socket. And then you've got that displacement of that hip joint, or if somebody pulls you by any of your limbs to transfer you, they can pull that joint right out. So those joints are kind of, they're um, made in this ball and socket because they're heavy use joints, but they're not 
uh, joints that should be pulled or stretched or, you know, they, they they're a little different than some of the other joints in your body. So those four joints are very important to take care of. And the reason why I bring that up is it brings us to the topic of fatigue when those muscles get fatigued, but sometimes our whole bodies get fatigued. And there's a difference between being tired, not getting enough sleep. We know that people who have paralysis, they, they can be tired during the day if they have to wake up to catheterize, wake up to turn, um, if they have um, an issue with tone or spasms that wake them up, if they have neuropathic pain that wakes them up at night. You can be very tired. Sometimes you just have a lot on your mind. And um, I call them red eyes. When you wake up in the middle of the night, you're up for a couple hours and you can't get something off your mind. And um, so sometimes people are just tired the next day because they didn't get enough sleep. You can take a nap, you can get, you know, go to bed uh, the next night, catch up on your sleep, do that kind of thing. Sleep is not a phenomenon where you can lose sleep all week. You know, some people, especially when they're working, they go to bed late, they get up early. They think, I'll catch up on my sleep on the weekend. It does, it's not a cumulative kind of thing. So you need to set practice good. We call it sleep hygiene. You need to practice good sleep hygiene so that you get go to bed at the same time. So your body gets used to that practice of going to sleep at that time organize the night time so that if you can organize your catheterizations so that you can get six hours of sleep, you can talk to your healthcare professional to see if you can reorganize your catheterization times. Um, you might, you can't go longer than six hours if you're doing intermittent cath or you shouldn't. Um, so talk to your healthcare professional. Sometimes uh, people will lay down in bed and have a few moments of relaxation for like an hour or so. Uh, before they uh, catheterize and go to sleep. Because when you put your feet up, all that dependent edema in your legs from not mobilizing your legs during the day, your legs will get edema in there. Even if you don't see it in your ankles or your lower legs, there's edema in there. So when they put their legs up and their, if their legs are as high as their heart, maybe they read for a while, do um, maybe a family activity together or something, while their legs are elevated, that brings the fluid up catheterize about an hour after having your feet up as high as your heart and you'll have you'll be able to have a longer time of rest sleep at night before you have to catheterize again i usually find it's the family members who are more tired from getting up and turning a person every couple of hours than it is the person they usually tend to uh, sleep right through that so check your sleep and look at the different kinds of things that you can do to kind of help get a better sleep now, fatigue is a different thing. That's just this whole body exhaustion. It's your nerves and your muscles. It's not only lack of sleep from your mind not being able, your brain not being able to turn off, but it's this whole body exhaustion and it comes to people with paralysis in different ways. So moving your body about through the day, doing transfers, um, pushing yourself in your chair, these things can all be very fatiguing, but there are other things that fatigue us too. The weather can fatigue us, even people without paralysis, but especially people who have paralysis or have problems with the autonomic nervous system. If you get overheated, that can be very fatiguing. Now getting too hot and, and dealing with humidity are kind of two different things. You can cool your body if it becomes too hot. You can go in an air conditioned place and so that helps reduce some of this fatigue. Humidity will really fatigue your body because it's cumulative in the body. It's harder to cool off when there's a lot of humidity in the air. So you need to avoid, if it's real high humidity outside, you need to kind of try to avoid that. Cool your car before you get in it. If it's cold weather outside, you want to dress for the weather, even though you don't feel it. I see a lot of people who will come in the middle of winter and they don't have shoes and socks on. They don't have a heavy, heavy coat on. And they, um, you know, they say, well, I don't feel it. But your body still reacts to it. Because remember, below your level of spinal cord injury or on the side where you've had a stroke, your body is still functioning. It's just not getting that message from the brain to function, to register that you're cold, but your body still feels that way. So um, 
that fatigue can come that way. Another thing that help that really wears out the body is if you're in a vehicle for a certain amount of time. So if you're traveling in a power chair or if you're traveling in some sort of vehicle, there's that motion that's going on. And when, when people who have sensation get in a car, you may not realize it, but you tense your body a certain way. Even though cars have smooth rides, in a car, you're kind of going like this and we tense our bodies. So we're not doing that. But if you can't tense your body in that subconscious sort of way, your body's doing this the whole time. And that's very fatiguing. So if you think about people on a jet, it's the same kind of thing. It's that motion, that movement of the jets, very smooth, unless you hit uh, bumpy skies, but it's usually very smooth, but there's this constant motion, motion, motion. It's the same thing in a, as in a car, there's this motion, 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 or when you're um, propelling your electric chair, there's this motion, motion, motion. And so your body just becomes very fatigued. So you've heard of jet lag, I call it car lag, if you're in the car for a long time. If you do have sensation and you've gone on a vacation and maybe you've sat in the car for eight, 10, 12 hours because you're trying to get to your destination without another hotel stop, and you're in the car for a very long time. Sometimes when you get out of the car and you lay down in bed at night, and you're trying to go to sleep, you still feel that movement of the car in your body, that vibration. So people with spinal cord injury or paralysis of any kind, they sometimes get that, that motion, but again, it might not register in their brain, but their body's still feeling that motion. So taking breaks during the day, if you, you know, if you're going on a a trip, if you can take um, breaks and get out of the car. If you're um, in a chair, you might want to just, you know, sit and be still for 10 or 15 minutes um, in, you know, in a quiet place, to just kind of let your body relieve some of that constant motion. So fatigue is just something to think about. People can get fatigue and not even realize it. And it really affects, it might affect your behavior, it might affect your mood, it might affect depression, that kind of thing, because you're just tired, but you don't know why you're tired. And usually that's, those are some of the reasons. So there's a lot of reasons um, that can affect um, fatigue. So allowing yourself time to relax and unwind is very important. Another thing about fatigue, sometimes uh, muscle cramping can occur, but maybe you don't sense that. And so um, all of your muscles are in balance in your body. You have muscles that pull towards your body and you have muscles that pull away from your body. So um, inside the muscle itself, there's an internal loop and those muscles always wanna pull towards the inside of the body, always. That's, that's the stronger of the balance of the two muscles. So it's important that those muscles are craving that movement. Otherwise, they're going to contract in, but they're really saying, move me, move me, move me. So periodically, if you can stretch your muscles through the day a few times, that's a good thing to do. Be sure and do your stretching motion, your movement, your range of motions every day. If you can do it first thing in the morning, if you do it last thing at night, that kind of helps relieve some of that tension in those muscles that helps kind of reduce some of your internal fatigue. So those are just some of the things to think about um, when when uh, thinking about fatigue, if you're thinking, I just don't feel quite myself today, but I'm not exactly sure what's wrong with me, consider it, it might be uh, fatigue. And so um, there's a question here um, about the phrenic nerve and the vagus nerve. And I wrote about those uh, last month. And this person believes the phrenic nerve was po possibly damaged during acute COVID infection, which is, uh, it, which is possible and ongoing long COVID they, because they uh, lost the ability to breathe with their belly. So breathing takes many muscles. The big three are your diaphragm that pulls down. And so the diaphragm um, pulls down, that's a movement by the autonomic nervous system. And then when it releases, it just relaxes. So there's not a muscle that pushes it up, but it, the diaphragm pulls it pulls it down and then relaxes and the lungs just naturally deflate. That pushes the air out. 
There are little tiny muscles in between each one of our ribs. Those are the intercostal muscles. So as the diaphragm is pulling your lungs down, the intercostal muscles are stretching and pulling your lungs out. So that's another muscle group. And the third muscle group uh, that's very important is the abdominal muscles. They also help bring that, um, help bring the diaphragm, pull the pull the lungs down. So sometimes people think, well, I don't have a problem with my lungs because I have a lower level injury. Well, you might if your abdominal muscles are affected or if you've had a stroke that is, are, is affecting some of your abdominal muscles. So he didn't realize that he had lost his ability to, to belly breathe until his uh, yoga instructor um, asked me to try to breathe with the diaphragm. And um, the abdominal muscles on the left lower side had atrophy. So he spent uh, three days working on this belly breath and he was watching his left stomach expand. It has normally been concave. Then he went to a physical therapist and they unlocked his diaphragm even more. So if you are, there are therapeutic exercises that you can do to increase your muscle in your diaphragm to increase your abdominal muscles and to help those intercostal muscles. Now there are other muscles up in your neck and your scalings uh, uh, along your back that help also uh, with um, breathing, but they're a little less involved. They're still important, but the big three are the big three. Um, another thing that you can use is to get one of these incentive spirometers. Now the price has gone up terrifically on these. They're, they used to be about between nine and $12. Now they're up to like $20, $30 because people in, in the time of COVID found out that this was a good way to exercise your lungs. And everybody who's been in the hospital with paralysis has received, I'm sure, an incentive spirometer. Oftentimes I find them still in the package. If people have even brought them home, they're like, I don't know what this is. Nobody ever used it, but this thing really works. So if you have a few extra bucks and you want to get an inexpensive incentive spirometer. They're available on Google. Now they're about $27 to $30. The price will be coming down as the demand comes down as we're getting further and further out of this COVID. If you have one around and you think, oh yeah, I remember that thing. It's in the closet behind the whatever. Dig it out and practice using those. Um, I have a cold. I use my incentive spirometer to help expand my lungs. I have used them with patients in the hospital with 100% satisfaction across the board. Sometimes people developing pneumonias, I, you know, let's use this incentive spirometer every couple hours through the night, boom, they're better by the next morning. So I have a great deal of personal experience with them and they are really terrific. So there's a link there on how to use your incentive spirometer. It's really a wonderful, inexpensive, but very effective um, object. If you use mechanical ventilation, you can use the side button. You might want to check with your healthcare professional to see how often you could be doing that to expand and contract your lungs. So very important things to take care of respiratory health. Now, there's a question that somebody's written in there from Canada, and they want to know if they can participate in some of the medical trials. Well, I will say to that answer, mostly yes. Um, there might be some trials that have some geographical limitation on them for whatever reason. Um, um, there are a lot of trials, uh, this is not related to paralysis, but there's a lot of trials in St. Louis that are related to uh, asthma because St. Louis happens to be the asthma capital of the world, which is an unfortunate title to have. But um, due to um, the conditions and the air quality, asthma is very pervasive. Now they've, they've improved it a lot, but sometimes there might be something like that where we're doing it in a confined geographical region for whatever reason. But um, mostly people can participate from other countries. If you have to go to the site, you have to have your own transportation generally to get there or whatnot. But there are a lot of uh, uh, clinical trials. You can find them on clinicaltrials.gov. That's the US website um, where anybody who has uh, public funding has to put their uh, clinical trial on that website. They give you what trials open. They give you um, information about how the um, trial is, how 
how they're recruiting people. Um, and then they will give you information updates as the trial closes. So even if you can't, you know, say you live in California and there's a, a study going on in New York, you, you know, you, you can't get to New York every other week to participate or whatnot, or in your Canada, you can't get to wherever you need to go. You can still take that information about that clinical trial to your own healthcare professional and say, is this something that maybe might help me and see if you can go out off label with that particular thing. See if your healthcare professional, if the um, person who's doing the clinical trial will open up a site where, you know, if your healthcare professional is interested in collecting data, there's a lot of questionnaires um, that you have to fill out. There's a lot of studies that are done where you don't have to travel, but they will send you the equipment. Sometimes um, things are done over the computer where you'll take measurements of, I don't know how, how much edema is in your legs or um, if you use some electrical stimulation, what's going on, you know, so there's all kinds of trials. So if you go to clinicaltrials.gov uh, and you look up um, uh, spinal cord injury, stroke, brain injury, um, you can kind of go through the filters and whittle that down to see what kind of things you're interested in. So be sure and look at that. And even if you don't qualify, but you think maybe you're interested in something in that particular clinical trial, um, talk to your doctor about it. So sometimes um, people are, are studying like over-counter medications, um, and their effects like uh, CoQ10. Uh, there's a lot of neurological implications on that. So there's a lot of studies on, on things like that. So, you know, talk to your doctors, print it off or, or bring your tablet and say, I, I've gotten this study and I'm interested. And what do you think this might help me? And, you know, get their opinion. Their opinion might be, no, I don't think this will help you or we don't have enough information, but that's more information that you had before. So gathering information and educating yourself is always useful for a variety of reasons. Okay, so um, this person writes in their 20 year old son is uh, a C3 Asia A since August of uh, 2019. And uh, they, they were told that all the nerves beneath the injury dies after 14 days, not necessarily true, but um, they leave behind the pathways to connect. Well, I think that um, there's some truth in that, but I think it's kind of muddled in the, in the process. Um, like, and then they go on to say like an electrical wire, the insulation is there, but the copper is not. So nerves are coated in a substance called myelin. And sometimes when there's a spinal cord injury, a brain injury or stroke, sometimes that myelin uh, gets removed from the nerve. Much like that wire, an electrical wire, unless the uh, conducting coating is around there, the nerve can't really transmit that message the message will be going, oh, it hits the place where the myelin and poofs, it uh, skirts off. Like multiple sclerosis is a, a loss, loss of this uh, myelin. So sometimes when there's an injury and there's overstretching, some of the myelin might be removed on some nerves. Some of it might not be removed on other nerves. So that, you know, it that's why every spinal cord injury is different. Some of the nerves are stretched too far that they can't carry messages anymore. Some nerves are actually ripped apart. Um, now, I always like to point out that due to this Asia A classification, due to the verbiage of it, Asia A says no uh, complete lack of message transferring from the brain to the, to the end of the spinal cord. That does not say complete severing of the, sp of the spinal cord. So um, most people do not have a complete severing of the spinal cord. I, it is so very rare. I mean, just so very rare. It's such unusual conditions that a complete, usually even if there's a knife or a bullet that goes through the spinal cord, there's still some nerve fibers that are still connected. So there's hope for everyone. So this individual went uh, 18 months ago, received a nerve transfer surgery. Now they didn't say what the what what part of the body was transferred, but this we do know: when nerves are transferred in the periphery, 
outside of the brain and spinal cord. So sometimes nerves are transferred to give somebody pinch function or to give somebody grasp function or nerves are transferred in the cauda equina, those parts of the spinal cord that are outside the central nervous system. And they'll do some transferring um, to help people uh, walk, reduce spasticity, um, gain bowel and bladder sexual function in males. So there's all kinds of reasons to do nerve transfer. Sometimes they're done up in the brachial plexus. Um, they can be done any, they can be done to, to create finger movement in one finger, or they can do up higher in the body, uh, closer to the spinal cord. So what we do know about peripheral nerves is that they regenerate at one inch per month. Okay, one inch per month. So if you're looking for hand function and they said, well, the problem's up here in the brachial plexus, you have to measure from your brachial plexus all the way down here. And on my arm, it's about 40 inches. It's a little more than a, a yard. I'll say 40 inches. On a man who has much larger wingspan, it's going to be quite a bit. On a woman who's a smaller body frame than I am, it could be a lot less. So whenever you have nerve transfer surgery, you can anticipate that you're not really going to see much function for the number of months for every inch of that nerve transfer. That's how long it takes for the nerve to regenerate. Now, if you have brachial plexus surgery and they relieve some constriction up there, you might see some function right away. If you have a nerve transfer in the brachial plexus, it might involve several nerves. So maybe you get shoulder function back or upper arm function back and then elbow function and then eventually it filters onto the hands. So this person did have hand grasp. Uh, so now he's doing his exercises and um, the rewiring of the brain is key there. Yes, your nervous system is what we call plastic in that it adapts. So if they can rewire something or even if, even if nothing is done, your nervous system is going to try to heal itself. It's going to try to figure out another way to get a message through. So it's important to know that there's a lot that's going on. and. And um, so she wants me to talk about nerve regrowth, our point to articles about that. And there are a lot, if you look up um, nerve regeneration, if you Google that, you're gonna come up with a lot of articles. If you go to the pubmed.gov site, um, they have all the research articles there and you can do um, a search uh, or an advanced search. So you could start out with, say um, stroke and uh, nerve transfers in the arm and maybe a specific nerve that was transferred and um, or nerve regeneration. You can filter it anyway and you can get all the articles uh, that you want on there. It's, it's, um, it's, really, it's really a, a handy thing to have. You can, you can get just all kinds of information. Um, there's another person that wrote in that they just read the book, um, Don't Call It a Miracle by Kate Willett. That's a very nice book. Um, it, it talks about the science behind all of these um, miracles. It depends on, you know, uh, what you think about um, miracles and that sort of thing. So um, one time when I, I was working and, and my daughter was, I I'm in late grade school and I came home. She says, mom, do you ever see a miracle at that hospital? But do you ever really see one? I'm like every day, because when I give somebody an antibiotic and they get better, there's science behind that. But I consider that a miracle. Um, when you use the incentive spirometer and you get rid of that rattling in your lungs and you don't get pneumonia, there's science behind that, but it's a miracle. So, you know, and it, it, there's science behind it all. Let's put it that way. That's the way we learn. What's the best way to treat uh, spasticity? Well, uh, Botox is right now the number one way, way to treat. There's a lot of oral medications that can be used. They affect the whole entire body. And some people don't like kind of the brain fog, sleepiness, fatigue that those medications give you. So people are elect electing now and the more the most popular uh, treatment uh, not by popular vote, but um, being the 
uh, most effective and uh, with least complications are these Botox injections. You do have to go back every four to six months, depending on your spasticity and, and get re-injected because the muscle does grow back. And so you get a little bit of Botox in there and, and it just uh, lessens the tension in that muscle. And so that, that is the way. If spasticity goes beyond that, you might want to have an implant put in. So they have pumps uh, that you can put baclofen in. It's like a little pacemaker size thing that goes in the abdomen. There's a little uh, tube that goes around and in the spinal column, not in the spinal cord, but in that spinal fluid that bathes the spinal column is where uh, baclofen is delivered directly to bathe the spinal column, which rela relaxes if you have really uh, horrific um, spasticity. But Botox is the way that most people are going. It's also used for migraines. Um, it's used for uh, all kinds of facial things never looks right on people. I just always think, why did you do that? Um, you know, we see a lot of stars, you know, and they all have the, the same uh, Botoxy look. Um, they also do a lot of lip smacking. If you see them, because it will tend to uh, roll out, especially if they have fillers put in, um, it'll tend to roll out the lips. So that part of the inside of your lip where it stays moist all the time is now exposed to air, but your body says, no, that should be wet. So like do a lot of lip smacking. And so I think, mm, I don't know what the advantage of that is. I'll stick with my, my wrinkles, my badges of courage. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have surgery to remove uh, my bladder stone. Um, can autonomic dysreflexia be an issue during this procedure? Yes. Um, that's why they monitor you and they'll monitor your blood pressure. And should your blood pressure start to change or rise, they will um, monitor that and control that for you. Be sure and mention it. I've not had autonomic dysreflexia. Ask them what my treatment would be should I something should happen to me. Take the AD wallet card from the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation and say, I'm concerned about this. Or I have bouts of autonomic dysreflexia. This is the treatment I use. Will you have that available while I'm having this? Now, they're going to answer, hopefully, yes, that they're prepared for this. They should know to be prepared for this. But it's always a good idea to bring things up to people's mind, put it in the foreword of their mind, because they're probably thinking, oh, bladder stone, we do this, we do this. I did, I did 500 of them last week, probably not that many, but, you know, they do a lot of them. Oh, wait a minute, red alert, spinal cord injury. Yes, thank you for the reminder. So it's always good to bring up things. If you're concerned about anything, just be sure and bring it up in a very polite sort of way and ask um, what you can do, what's going to happen to you should this occur. Because it's always nice. It's reassuring for you. They want you to be comfortable too. And it's nice to know if something should go wrong, this is what's going to happen. So we're prepared. And it's nice to know that people are prepared. Um, so shoulder exercises. Um, yes, I always talk about the range of motion exercises because everybody can do those. There's usually not a limit unless that, you know, you have a contracture or something. You should always, before you start any new medication, exercise, any kind of treatment, you should always talk to your individual healthcare provider because there could be something that's so unique to you. So that is an important thing um, to, to think about. But <clears throat> there are a lot of videos. There's a lot of instructions online. I would recommend that you get a PT session. You can have one session to learn uh, shoulder exercises to strengthen your shoulders or uh, to provide more range or whatever it is, the particular issue. If you're worried about overuse of your shoulders, how you can, how you can do things in different ways to protect your shoulders. And I will say, not knowing everybody's individual insurances, but usually you can have a treatment like that. Now, <clears throat> even public or private insurance. So if you're insurance is handled by the state or if you have a private insurance policy. Most policies now, changes by the moment, have two weeks for mobility training. So if you're interested per year, so it, and a lot of people just let that slide by because they have no issues. So, you know, didn't need it, didn't think about it, whatever. But always be sure and use your two weeks because, um, you know, it's, it's money that you have in your, in your, 
policy, so use it. Um, so if you're worried about, um, say you wanna protect your shoulders as you're transferring and moving about and what kinds of things do I need adaptions to my wheelchair? Or what kind of things do I need? <clears throat> Go to a, a get, you can use part of that two weeks. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, but that's a mobility exercise. That's mobility training because that's how you move. So that's an advantage that you can have if you're, you know, you can get um, therapy. Your doctor uh, might have exercise uh, sheets. A lot of them have uh, access to programs that are approved medical exercise programs that they can uh, copy off for you. So you can do that at home, you know, so there's, there's all kinds of different ways, but you're going to your healthcare professional anyway, why not get that? It can be part of your regular checkup as well. Um, they can give you those handout sheets or they can give you a prescription to go to therapy, but there's also videos and instructions when you go on your own, it's kind of like we mentioned, we were talking about yoga and you can get yoga, follow yoga exercises on videos and therapies, but unless you have that yoga instruction instructor, there are like certain moves or when they position, like your pelvis has to be tilted in a certain way to really feel that, um, what you're trying to accomplish. And you don't get that a lot on those um, individual um Google kinds of things. So it's good to have somebody show you really how to do those exercises. If you're going to a therapist to learn how to do it, take your camera or have somebody come with you to record the exercises so you can see what's going on. So when you get home and you're like, oh, I need to do this or I need to have my caregiver give do this uh, therapy for me, you can look back at that and see how they how that exercise is done if you're if you're doing enough or what you're doing. So you know, you could, there's a lot of ways you can get the biggest bang for your buck. Um, is hyperbaric oxygen therapy used at treatment for SI, for spinal cord injuries? And is it safe? Yes, it is being used. It's being used, especially um, in the area of pressure um, injury treatment. Um, and it is being used for spinal cord injury. Now, is there enough demonstrated evidence that it works. I don't think that the body of knowledge, I think there's, there are some studies that demonstrate that it is effective. There are some studies that said, well, it kind of did something, but really not that much. Maybe we didn't do it long enough. Maybe we didn't this, that, or the other thing. Um, so talk to your own individual uh, physician about it. See if it's available in your area for spinal cord injury. Um, is it safe at, um, you're monitored. So I would think that it would be safe, um, but I don't know that the body of evidence is there enough to say, oh yes, this is the treatment. It's done in some places. People have some speculations about it. So I think that you probably want to talk to your individual healthcare provider for your needs in particular. Um, so I, the jury's out on that. Let's say that one. Um, so somebody has put in here about um, they want some information um, in regards uh, to complete severance uh, T10. Probably not. And, uh, you know, that's a bold thing for somebody to say who doesn't know anything about this person, but probably your spinal cord is not completely severed. Messages are not getting through at that area, but it's probably not completely severed. Uh, what's the possibility of walking? Well, at T10, you can, you can learn to walk uh, with braces. Um, so, you know, that's a complete possibility um, now. Um, uh, there's also a lot going on with the functional electrical stimulation. And there's a question above this one about the effectiveness of functional electrical stimulation. That is something that has been demonstrated to be very effective. Um, and, and the body of knowledge of this is growing, 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 growing. It's still a very expensive proposition. So it's not really easy to obtain, but it's getting much easier. Something you can do is to take that two weeks of uh, mobility training and try out some of the uh, functional electrical stimulation equipment to see how it works on you. So that's a possibility. At T10, you should be able to stimulate your lower spinal cord. Um, there's so much that's going on in this 
area right now. So there's electrical stimulation that's placed on the surface of the skin. So a patch over the um, lower spinal column or on the, the muscles of the buttocks and thighs to create that um, walking. Um, now, I'm sure that you're thinking of walking like you walked before, and that's not there yet, but it's also very close. In healthcare years, it's also very close. For people who are waiting it, it's every day is like 100 years of waiting. Um, so that is a possibility. Now, at T10, um, they're also looking for information about um, uh, in, in increasing their sex life. And all the medications um, are difficult either to take, and there's a variety of things. There's a pump that you can use for males to um, create blood flow. It's, it's um, really like a tube and it's just like really a pump. And it causes a lot of blood flow to the penis. So that gives an erection. Some people do that. Some people uh, do um, injections into the penis that increases the blood flow. And, uh, gives an erection. Some people use functional electrical stimulation either on the outside of the body or as an implant um, that can uh, serve for sexual function in males, not in females, mm. um, can control uh, urination and uh, stimulate uh, bowel evacuation. So those are, those are the th that is available on the market right now. Uh, that's an implant and there's a list there that's come up now about sexual health in their sexual health booklet from the Reeve Foundation, which you can download all the products from Reeve, all the educational information. It's just free. So, you know, it's just like, great. Just, you know, it's all um, um, checked by professionals and it, it's really good information. So, the, so there's a lot of possibilities in the future, especially for walking. There's a lot of possibilities for walking. Now, a lot of people don't like so much the bracing and the um, using a walker because for walking, what people think is I've got to be able to stand and put weight through my legs. We can do that through electrical stimulation. We can give you tone in your legs to, for your muscles to contract and, and relax to stimulate the, get, the walking possibility. Okay. Um, there is something called the pattern generator in the spine that is kind of a redundant reflex of the brain that if you can get somebody walking in that gait pattern and you support their body in a harness so that their body is in elevated in standing position. If you get their legs walking through robotics or somebody moving their legs, they will continue that for a certain amount of time. So Christopher Reeve on the partial weight supported walker, they would get his legs started and then he would just continue to walk through not control of his brain, but through this redundant pattern until eventually, you know, you kind of trip up a little bit because each step is not exactly, um, the, you know, the same as it was. So until you, cause you know, you're not accommodating for those little nuances as differences. So things happen with that, but the, there is this pattern response in walking. FES harnesses that and takes control of that. The reason why people don't so much like the bracing and uh, using the walker is because balance is the hardest thing. Balance and coordination is the hardest thing for walking. So we can get your legs going. That's, that's, that's accomplished. We can do that. The problem is holding up your body in that trunk control and knowing where your body is in space, coordinating all of this together. So you're really holding up your body when you're holding on to that walker and gripping that walker and really holding up your body. So it's very labor intensive. And a lot of people uh, have it, and they like it. Some people have it and they say, you know, I only want to use it at certain times. Um, other people are like, yeah, it's just too much work. I'm not going to do it. So there's a lot going on uh, with the effectiveness of FES. It is very effective. Um, it has uh, very few complications. It's been kind of surprising that there has been so many, so few complications with it. Um, you would think that, that perhaps there would be a bit more, but fortunately it's not. So we know that 
we know that people's, uh, you know, it's an exercise. So you need to start out slowly because you don't feel your body overworking. But you know, when you go to the gym and you work out and you come home fatigued, your muscles are fatigued. FES can fatigue your muscles. So sometimes people get on it. The FES, they're on the FES bike and they're pedaling and it's 10 minutes, you got to stop. Well, no, I don't, I don't, I feel great. I want to keep going. No, you have to stop because you don't want to overdo. You need to build up your muscles back into that, but they build up like in an incredibly quick amount of time. So that is, it's really, it's really a good thing. Um, there's somebody who's written out about their ileostomy. So that's a pouch that's worn to collect urine. And it has, uh, the pouching system creates skin reactions that are almost like allergic reactions. They've signed up for allergy testing. Do you know any um, companies producing pouching systems for sensitive skin? Well, all of them are supposed to be for sensitive skin. Something that happens sometimes if the pouch is not um, completely sealed around that opening in the skin. So if urine is getting on that on, on skin, it's very caustic. That's why people get pressure injuries on their rear ends if, when they're wet all the time because uh, urine and stool is very caustic. Diarrhea, oh my gosh, just burn the skin right off of you. Um, but um, so if urine is getting on that, um, on your skin, that's gonna, that's gonna create a rash. There is a little thing, it comes in a little package like an alcohol wipe. Alcohol wipes won't work, but there's this thing called skin prep, and that's what it's called, skin prep. And if you put that on the skin around that, it is shocking how it reduces this irritation. So people who wear uh, external catheters, better known as condom catheters, they will sometimes put the skin prep on their penis because when the urine comes out of the urethra, it has to go through the tube to the drainage bag, but sometimes the urine comes out at more force. So the urine gets on the penis and then it sits there in this rubber uh, external catheter all day and you get this really severe rash from that, but this skin prep will help uh, take care of that. Also making sure that the, um, that the stickiness of the pouch is right around the opening. This is the same thing for colostomies as well. So those are kinds of things. If, the, if you're having a reaction to one product, you can try another product and see sometimes uh, these companies will send you samples so that you can try to see which product works best for you because they want you to like their product and then they want you to start using it. So samples um, are a good thing, but skin prep, not cream, not lotion, not anything else, the skin prep stuff. And you can usually buy it like right in your um, drugstore, but you can also get it on Amazon, it's called skin prep. Okay, um, here's a person that had rotator cuff surgery, how timely, and developed a pressure ulcer, it's finally closed. Besides keeping an eye on it, wondering how to care for it in the summer months. Well, now you didn't say if you got the pressure ulcer in the rotator cuff site or on your rear end, maybe from not laying on the rotator cuff site. So, but a pressure ulcer is, um, or pressure injury, as we call them now, um, pressure ulcer. I, I, def, I deflect to that because that's what I was brought up with. Okay, but um, how to care for it in summer months. So you want to watch it and you want to watch it very carefully. Once a pressure ulcer injury has healed, that is now scar tissue. And that is not as elastic as our regular tissue. Um, so um, see our regular tissue is so it just like, look, it stretches and bends around our joints and, ne you know, never sags except sometimes. Um, but anyway, um, that pressure injury, it has left a scar on your skin. So that skin is going to be more tender because it's not going to have that elastic give. So you're going to have to watch it more carefully. Um, summer months, um, uh, winter months, you're just going to have to watch it more carefully. You're going to have to build up your skin tolerance all over. But check it, check it, check it. Now, sometimes a scar will have a different pigmentation color. Sometimes they don't, but they're still very tender skin because no elastic. So if you see the pigmentation change, stay off of it immediately. In the summertime, um, I'm sure you're wondering about moisture. Now, at C6, you might be, um, 
you might not sweat. So you think, well, I don't have to worry about moisture, but some people with high, with spinal cord injury do the exact opposite. You know, in medicine for every role, there's an exact opposite. So some people sweat excessively. So you want to keep it clean and dry. So if you have a little bit of dribble from doing your catheterization, or if it's around um, the sacral area or on where you sit, uh, realize that people pass gas all day. There's the children's book, The Gas We Pass. Yes, people with spinal cord injury, brain injury, any, any, anybody, everybody passes gas. And so with that, there can be a little bit of leakage that you might not even realize is a little bit of moisture. So you want to keep everything extremely clean and dry from catheterization, bowel programs. You want to be sure and be doing your um, pressure release you want to make sure that your um, uh, pressure dispersion equipment is up to date. You always want to use medical grade equipment. Some people will say, and I was, I was in the facility, I just about blew my mind. And this doctor said, oh, we're getting a pressure ulcer. They took a pillow off the bed and threw it on the chair and said, there, you've got cushion now. No, pillows contract down, they don't disperse pressure out. So if you use a pillow, you're creating even more pressure on your area. If you go to the craft store and say, oh, I need some new foam for my chair, I'll go to the craft store. No, that creates more pressure because it doesn't disperse the, the weight of your body. It just create, it just holds more pressure there. And besides crafting um, uh, foam is very, it, it, it's, made so that it doesn't breathe. Your skin does not breathe. So that's creating more moisture there. So be sure and get medical grade equipment. If you feel like your equipment is not functional or if there's something wrong, talk to your healthcare professional about getting that. So doing all the regular things, building up your skin tolerance, watching, watching, watching. Now um, we have one more, one more question on how to lose weight with a spinal cord injury. And I will refer to you, we just had an interview with Dr. David Gator, who's just fabulous. He is the head of the, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not saying his title correctly, but he's the director of Miami Project and uh, to cure paralysis. But um, they do a lot of work and his whole lifetime body of work has been about uh, weight control and how to calculate how many calories you need. Um, and he has a formula for doing that. You can get his article about that. Take it to your healthcare provider. Go to a nutritionist, preferably somebody who works in spinal cord injury will know about Dr. Gator's work, be able to create a diet for you. Um, it's, it's different for spinal cord injury because you're, you're doing, oh, and the webinar link has just come up there. Um, it's different for people with spinal cord injury because you're not using the same number of calories that people who are mobile are using. Now, some athletes might be using more calories, but one of the important things is, is that usually the leg muscles, those giant muscles in our thighs are affected. And those are the muscles that are really metabolizing and burning a lot of calories. So the more you can uh, utilize those muscles, um, how FES affects uh, weight. If you're using the FES bike, does that affect your um, amount of fat? Well, um, that's something that they're looking into right now. So we don't really have the answer on that, but those that uses those big muscles. Um, so it does have an effect on um, the secondary complication of diabetes. So that's, an, go all, it all intertwines. So anyway, um, th um, there's more, there's a lot more to be coming out on that. But looking at the number of calories that you need versus the number of calories and then getting calories that mean something. So proteins, carbohydrates, knowing how many fruits and vegetables to eat, all that sort of thing. So get with a good nut uh, nutritionist or dietitian who knows something about spinal cord injury who can help with that. And then also check out Dr. Ga David Gator's work um, because he's really got he's really got the market cornered on this. Now, don't we also talked about don't confuse. Sometimes people get the stomach pouch, and that is something pouch or pooch. I've heard it called both things and people get, how do I get rid of that? How do I get rid of that? Generally, if the rest of your body is not, um, have a lot of fat content, 
that is probably not so much fat does collect there, but that's probably no, not as much fat as it is lax muscles. So getting your muscles taut is um, a difficult thing. So people have a lot of concern about that when it's really uh, lax muscles. Sometimes when you sit, you know, you get that, you know, they call it the middle age spread. If your muscles are not engaged, you, you know, your hips kind of spread out. And that's from, that's from um, your muscles not being able to uh, contract as they need to be. So don't confuse being fat from being, uh, having just kind of lax muscles. That's an important thing to remember. And with that, I see our time has come. So I, I again, I wanna thank you. Oh, there was one more question. I'm gonna answer it really quickly. Um, and that was about uh, somebody who had heterotrophic ossification. That is a phenomenon, it happens after a stroke, it happens after spinal cord injury, it can happen after brain injury, where for some reason a joint, it's usually the bigger joints in the shoulders or in the hips, um, where the bone starts growing out into the muscles. So uh, bone cells that are replacing bone cells that are turning over, instead of staying within the bone system, it moves out into the muscles and then that joint becomes frozen. And so there are medications that, um, there's several medications now. Um, uh, Didronel used to be the popular drug. Uh, there's uh, so very much more. Uh, Indomethacin, um, meloxicane. So find, talk to your healthcare professional because there are drugs that can help reduce it. If it's so bad, then the surgery has to be done to loosen the joint. But you also, because that bone tissue has grown into the muscle, you have to retract some of that muscle tissue. So you want to get on that right away. And that's why it's so important for me to ask to get to this one. Talk to your healthcare professional, get on the medication so that you can help control that before it gets into the need for surgery. If you need surgery, then it's better because you need to have your joint so that you can move your joint. And then um, once you're able to move the joint, you got to follow up on those stretching exercises to make sure that things are moving and, and uh, you can still use your joints. So with that, I apologize for going on and on, but I always have such a great day. This is my, my favorite day of the whole month. So I appreciate you coming and I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.